version of my home here in Providence, Rhode Island. <laughs> um, you may see at some point, um, and I apologize in advance, our cats are Cecil, um, sort of a, a tiger stripy cat, and Maisie, who's a really nutty looking um, uh, calico. So you may see them, you may see my wife, Kathy, passing through. So forgive us, um, but welcome. Um, a couple of just quick uh, points before we launch into, you know, the, the slides. Um, we, you know, we're going to end up covering a fair amount of information in a reasonably short time. And um, gosh, I've been doing the seminar um, for about 12 years now. And so, you know, I've managed to sort of learn a few things about how people seem, you know, to prefer things to go. Um, I tend to find that um, it's jollier and more fun if, you know, if we're, as Robert said, if we're comfortable, um, you know, asking questions um, and then, you know, talking about stuff that we're concerned about rather than me just droning on, okay? And if there's a top, if, if there's something that's been nagging you um, about publishing or writing for kids that I'm not covering, I would ask, please, that you go ahead and, you know, carve out a minute to ask me about it well, while I'm here. I'm, I'm totally fine with, after this is over, you emailing a follow-up email or two, but, but you got me now, and you got me for, for 90 minutes, so use me. Uh, it's about you. It's not about me, okay? Um, I'll just uh, scan a, a few. I have a few of my titles here. Um, I, I hope you can see these. Uh, or is everyone seeing seeing some titles here? Yes. Okay, good. There are some books. Um, I grew up in New York City. My mom and dad were both writers for the old Life magazine. I don't know if anyone remembers Life. Um, and my dad was a novelist. Um, went to Middlebury College in Vermont, and and I have an MFA from from Brown. Um, and one of the, what I find, um, one of the great things about writing and writing for kids is that it's not about credentials. It, it doesn't matter if you have a degree in it. It doesn't matter if you have experience in it. In fact, is there any way, um, let's feel free if we, if we can to go ahead and guess, uh, at stuff. Is there any way that somebody knew to the children's book writing field might have a sneaky kind of advantage over um, a medium part of the kids' book world, okay? A mid-list author. Is there any way that somebody brand new and fresh might have an advantage? Anyone? <laughs> Take a risk. Is it not possible that freshness might come from newness. I don't know how things are in, in your work world, but um, in many parts, uh, I know my wife happens to be a CPA, and occasionally a new hire at her firm will have an interesting or fresh new perspective, okay? So um, I say that as a word of encouragement, but also, you know, you know, a lot of folks in Massachusetts, Rhode Island especially, think that it's all about connections. Um, it's not all about connections. It's all about you being persistent and you creating and writing something fresh, interesting, and new. Okay? Let's look at the first slide. Can we see this? Uh, Peter, not yet. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. It's a comment here. Can we, can we see it? Can we see it now? Can we see it now? Yes, Peter, yep. Great, okay. So um, let's launch into it here. Um, we're, we're gonna play um, 
as I often do when I teach the seminar, um, we're going to play a little sort of a game show, myths or facts. <laughs> and um, I'm curious, you know, in, in, is it Tuxbury? Is that how you say it? Tuxbury? Tuxbury? Uh, to, the, se the, se the second way you pronounced it, Tuxbury. Tuxbury, okay, great. So I don't know where people hang out. Is there, you know, a local CVS or something or general store? Are, are there any general stores? Probably not. But um, tell me what you've heard on, on these various topics. Do we think, do we think we need an agent to get a children's book published? Anyone hear anything about that one way or the other? Yes, I've heard. Yep. Go ahead. I think somebody um, was speaking, but then they kind of got muted. Are you guys hearing um, a speaker? Yes, uh, that would be me. I, I have heard that you need an agent because oh, okay. yeah. um, so many submissions that an agent will sift through and be listened to better. And, and what do agents do? Let's, let's be sure we're all on the same page with what, what, a, what would a literary agent do for either a writer who's published some books or a new writer? Anyone, anyone have an idea what an agent does? It's don't. okay. It's fine if you don't. Um, agents do a couple of things. One of them is, as um, whoever uh, was speaking mentioned, agents um, look at submissions, just like editors at publishing companies do, and they try to find um, writers who have uh, book projects that they feel are going to, to be saleable and that they feel are of quality, okay? So they're gatekeepers, just like editors of publishing companies. And um, is, is that helpful to, we write, to those of us who write? Sure, it's helpful. There's something else agents can do for us. And um, two other things, in fact. One of them is um, agent, a good agent. I had, I was lucky to have, uh, you know, an older, agent at Curtis Brown Agency in New York for years, and she knew all the, the players in the publishing world. She knew editors at different publishing companies, and she went to lunch with editors. And, and she would be a good person if, if I have a new book out on baseball or dogs or boats. She was a great help to me because she would say, oh, Peter, I'll try it out on, on such and such editor at, you know, um, let's say Simon and Schuster who loves dogs. Okay. So agents are good at connecting us with um, publishers and they're good at, at advising us on quality. Is there anything else that a good literary agent might do for you and for me? Yeah. I heard they help you get a better deal financially. Terrific. Exactly. Okay. Excellent. Um, so a good agent is kind of an uh, intriguing mix between um, somebody who knows the literary world um, and somebody who's uh, a bit of a lawyer. Okay. A good agent is, is somebody who negotiates as well as connects uh, those of us who write with publishers. So um, is, is, is knowing, um, a lot about contracts, something that many of us who write necessarily know. Not, certainly not something I know or ever knew. Okay. So the whole business side of getting a book published and writing is something that an agent can help us with. Okay. And I, I again, I'm not um, able to, to necessarily focus on who's commenting, but the person who mentioned negotiating contracts is right on on point in that a good agent can sometimes get you a little more money. And when I say money, how are authors, how are you going to be paid as an author when you get your first book published? <laughs> I see a few smiles there. How, how, what, what is the system called? It's okay if you don't know, it's fine. Um, it's authors, generally speaking, who are traditionally published, okay, like me, are paid through royalties. And royalties is a fancy word for something very simple. And it, it simply means that we're paid 
a percentage of the cover price, usually seven to 10% of the cover price of every book of ours that a publisher sells, okay? You with me? And then there's some, a special sort of special chunk of money up front that um, we authors usually, not always, but usually get from a publisher. Anyone know what that's called? An advance? Got it, right okay. on. So uh, relax and realize, even if you're wrong, we're, there, I'm not grading you, okay? <laughs> but, so it's totally cool if you guess and you're wrong. Um, but that's exactly what it is. An advance is simply, just to get this business stuff out of the way, it's simply um, a hunk of money. It's usually, you know, seven to 10,000 bucks for a newer writer. Um, and it's based on a whole bunch of calculations that the publisher does um, based on them saying, well, over the, the whole lifetime of this person's book, they're probably going to earn, you know, um, 20,000 bucks. So we're going to give them 10,000 up front as just like in, in baseball, let's say. It's a way of saying to a, a, a rookie ball player, we want you. We want you for the Red Sox. So we're going to give you, uh, give you a bonus, okay? It's a way a publisher tells you, a new author, we want to sign you, and here's a, a, a vote of confidence, okay? So, Peter, can I ask a question? So, Peter, okay. are you going to be covering uh, agents um, uh, in future slides, or if people have questions about agents, they should ask them now? Um, they can ask them now. Um, okay. I, I, I'm just hold your question for just a second. So, um, by all means, ask me about them now. Um, but so it's sounding, is it not like agents might be good to have? Would you say? Who pays them? Robert Hayes pays them. <laughs> not really, but but if, if when you're you know represented by an agent. Anyone uh, have a thought about how they get their, their daily bread? No reason you should know this, but guess, guess who pays them? We pay them, okay? We humble uh, writers pay our agents. And I, when I mention this in, in this seminar, people often, there's often a groan that, that sort of goes through the audience. And, um, and so I, I usually ask, well, how come you're groaning? And I'm not surprisingly, uh, a room full of writers will groan when we, we think about turning over some of our hard won cash, right? Um, is there any positive with we writers paying an agent as opposed to a publisher paying them? Think about it. Think about when you pay somebody, who are they focusing on as, as somebody to, to uh, serve? They're focusing on us, okay? So it's in many ways a positive that um, we writers, that agents earn a percentage of what we writers earn, okay? Even though many of us really don't make a whole huge amount of, uh, of annual salary. So um, it's going to have to be up to you guys whether, you know, an Asian is uh, – something you, <laughs> you, you know, want to um, share your, your, your winnings with, okay? And, and before, if you have questions, that's great, but I, I just want to finish the whole agent uh, 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 point. Um, do we need an agent to get a children's book published? The answer to that is no, you don't. Um, you will hear uh, at many different points in your career, you'll hear people saying, you've got to go get yourself an agent, okay? So I'm just, I'm trying to refute that up front. Um, and what I've discovered um, as I talk to editors at publishing companies and various writers over the years is that with children's books in particular, it is much harder right now in a tough, tight market to go directly after getting an agent as opposed to reaching out directly to publishers, okay? So what you're going to hear for the next, uh, you know, hour and a half is really how to do it um, the way that I think is easiest and best, and that's to go directly to editors at publishing companies, okay? Any agent questions? 
So we have uh, several in the chat, uh, Peter. Okay. I can relay them to you. Yeah, please. Uh, Mindy wants to know, are agents paid up front? Um, a good agent should never, ever, there are agents trolling for business out there and they'll say for 500 bucks or something, I will represent you. Okay. Those agents are not accredited by, you know, the American Association of Literary Agents. And, and I would strongly advise you not pay anyone claiming to be an agent money up front. An accredited agent um, earns money only as a percentage of sales, as a percentage of them selling your work, okay? And you getting paid, then they take a, a chunk of that, okay? Um, let's see, uh, Monique, uh, oh, I just, I just outed you, Monique, I'm sorry. Um, someone has a, sent me a couple of questions directly. Um, um, how, how, do, how do you find an agent and how do you evaluate an agent? You know, what, what makes an agent good? Okay. So, um, again, um, I don't want to spend too much time on finding agents because I think you're going to waste a huge percentage of time as a newer author. Um, I'll put on the, uh, in our next slide, I'll have a, a bunch of different uh, resources for you, including a handbook with names and addresses of agents. Okay. So you can use that if, that, if you really want to go directly for agents, okay? Uh, but, but again, I think you're, you're making life much harder for yourself if you go, go for an agent first. Once you have your first offer from a publisher or first book published, that's the moment when literary agents will perk up and pay attention, okay? Uh, let's uh, two two more quick agent questions. Huh? Um, who owns the copyright when you sell your book? Okay, um, you own the copyright and you retain the rights to your work even when your book is published by uh, you know a third party publisher. Okay, if you look in the front piece uh, uh, of various books, it can be you know Dr. Zeus book, an Eric Carle book, doesn't matter you will see the copyright is held in an author's hands, okay? What you do sign away uh, in a contract, contract is between an author and a publisher, you sign away certain interim rights, rights of, you know, um, them uh, publishing it in a certain way. You always have, um, you know, uh, you're always part of that process, but you, you retain the copyright. Uh, final question goes to Amanda. Uh, isn't it true that many publishers will not accept unsolicited manuscripts? Always maybe you'll true. address that later. Sure, I will. But um, that's always going to be true. There, there are always a, 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 a segment of the um, uh, 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 publishing world out there that at any given moment is not going to look at unagented manuscripts, okay? We're lucky, those of us who write for children, in that there are still a, a quite a number of good, uh, solid children's publishers who are open to uh, people who don't yet have an agent, okay? And so, um, uh, yeah. Peter, uh, Ellie wanted to know, will she have access to these slides um, after the program is over, or should people just take really good notes? <laughs> Um, I, I suggest taking good notes. If um, you want me to later, if you email me, I will, I can, you know, attach a slide or two for you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, what about number two here? Um, would you, could you, <laughs> in a box with a fox, should you connect with a, an illustrator before submitting your, your project? Is anyone who's here now both an author and an illustrator? It's okay if you're not. I'm, I don't, I can barely even draw stick figures, okay? Um, but number two, I plop up there right, right off the bat because there are a lot of folks out there who spend a heck of a lot of time um, looking so they, they put up notices or go on chat rooms for art schools, for instance, and, and just and try to find somebody to illustrate their work prior to submitting it, OK? 
Okay? Is there anything wrong with that? Nothing at all wrong. Are there authors who are both authors and illustrators out there that we know of? Are we familiar with any? There are, you know, umpteen dozens, hundreds of well-known authors out there who are both as, as you know, we can, we can rattle them off. who are both, you know, uh, successful authors and illustrators. But the question before us really is, is this something we need to spend our time on right off the bat? And um, I'll, I'm going to answer my own question here just to save time. And the answer is, is no, you, you by no means need to, you, you by no means need to uh, find somebody to work with to illustrate your book project, okay? I meet a lot of people in giving this seminar who want to work with their, you know, sister or their mom or, or a friend who's a good artist. That's terrific. That's fine. Publishers out there and agents out there are more than willing to look at single uh, themed or two headed submissions. The single uh, basic submission, and this is how I've sold all of my books, is simply words on white paper. Okay? No dingbats, no scribbles, no little, you know. Um, uh, desktop publishing uh, dogs or palm trees or any of that, um, simply words on paper. Uh, so um, I urge you not to, uh, not to go trolling around for somebody uh, in advance who, who, who will you know, make your book uh, feel or look more finished, okay? Publishers, surprisingly for many, are very, very, very open to simply finding gold in people with really interesting words, fresh words. Just to give you a quick example, I don't have a copy of it. My first book for kids was called Red Cat, White Cat from Henry Holt, and it was sold with nothing more than this. Um, red Cat, White Cat, Day Cat, Night Cat, Up Cat. Down cat, farm cat, town cat, in cat, out cat, thin cat, stout cat, etc. Okay? No decorations, no dingbats, no nothing. Okay? And I tell you that um, just so we can sort of try to get our heads back to the point of how simple children's books really can be. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, hop on pop, okay? We're all grown-ups, and, you know, we spend a lot of time in our working world complicating our lives and, and complexifying our projects. Um, when we're writing for kids, we, I think, help ourselves a lot when we bring things back to a much simpler level, okay? Questions? Uh, there's a few in the chat regarding illustrations. Okay. Um, Monique says, I've always understood publishers prefer to pick the illustrator. With just words on paper, would you make page breaks, especially for children's books? And Christine has a similar question. Should the words be written in one continuous document or separated into pages? Great questions. Very good questions. Um, I think there is some truth to the idea. You guys are obviously um, pretty... Um, well prepared for this. Um, there is actually, I think, some truth to the idea that publishers do like to, to they, publishers tend to have a lot of um, established uh, illustrators on file, okay? They, they have portfolios of excellent um, artists, and what they love more than a lot of other parts of their job is connecting fresh new artists, I mean, uh, fresh new text from people that haven't published before with an illustrator who, who has a little bit of a following, okay? So right on target there. Um, then the question was, do, how, how do you paginate your, your submission, okay? Do you, I think I'm remembering this, that the question was, um, do you just submit it like a high school paper, page after page, or do you chop it up? Number one, you don't have to worry. I'm giving you an example here. You don't have to worry about 
number one, the number of pages in your submission at all, period, okay? Tons of advice out there saying picture books have to be 32 pages. Um, and so you, people are panicking in every seminar I give about, oh my God, I don't have 32 pages and how many words do I have to have? It doesn't matter because we don't know, we authors don't know how our final books are going to be laid out, do we? And we don't know how our final books will be paginated because they haven't reached the point of working with a designer, a publisher, and an artist. So notice, if you can see it, my book, Jack Hammer, Sam from Macmillan, on this two-page spread only has one tiny little uh, uh, stanza of text. Can everyone see that? I hope, okay. And then um, I flip the page. Um, there's another page with just one. I flip it. There's another page with one stanza. Then I flip the page. Lo and behold, on this page, there are four little stanzas. Are you with me? So um, I, tell, I show you this not to, you know, um, complicate your life, but to simplify it in that um, you don't have to panic about um, the um, format of, of how you're submitting your fresh, interesting words, okay? Um, publishers and editors are really smart about even in even if you crayon something on a roll of toilet paper <laughs> a, a good editor can see value and beauty in what you're submitting okay that said I think it's a it's worth saying that from what I've heard from editors children's book editors that rather than a submission of page after page of just, you know, text like, um, like you might submit a high school paper, um, they, they're happy if you roughly chop up your text, roughly I say, don't panic about it, you don't, don't have to have a word count, but roughly chop up your text into page size chunks. You with me? Okay. All right. So, um, Let's quickly look at a marketable topic. Um, so what do we think about that? Um, I'm, I'm always fine that there are teachers and there are uh, moms and dads in my seminars, and that's great. My wife and I don't have kids, um, so you guys have an advantage over me. Um, you may know what's marketable in, you know, for certain age group kids out there. Um, well, what about that? Should we should we pick a topic, uh, we authors, that, that we think is, is going to be a big hit with, I don't know, nine-year-olds? What if we did want to do that? Could, could we do it? Anyone, um, anyone deal with kids? Uh, you know, I go into schools and read my books, and uh, I got to say, every time I go in, I'm like, whoa, what I thought was – cool for kids at a certain age is like completely gone. Um, so what is the problem there, if there is a problem, about trying to settle on a marketable topic? Any issue there? Be brave. I think, okay, I'll answer it myself. <laughs> I'm really good at answering my own I was going to say, by the time your book yeah. comes out, it might not be popular any longer. Bingo. Exactly. I teach preschool, so. Ah, you're all over it. So <laughs> you get it. You get it. And in fact, it's very likely um, if things go real smoothly, and let's say your book gets uh, picked up by a publisher within, you know, a few months of your starting submissions, and then... Could it take a year or more for your book to go through production and uh, get published actually and get out there? Heck yes, okay? Could take longer. So very good point, thank you. And um, bingo on, on the time lag. And um, another issue is, um, you know, I'm never sure, you know, for we grownups, I remember when I was 11 or something, the, the grown-ups sometimes would try to, like, get a sense of what was cool for us 11-year-olds in city and country school in Greenwich Village. 
But guess what? They had no idea. We had secret cool stuff that they didn't know about. So um, thirdly, and most importantly, um, if there's something you take away from tonight, um, one of the things that anyway, is I think truly that um, when I have, you know, tried in any way to write something for reasons like I think it's going to sell or I think it's going to, you know, uh, appeal to a certain editor, okay, or, or a certain age group. Any time I've done that, what have I produced? I've produced a dud. When I've succeeded and other writers I've talked to, it has come when I've taken something that matters to me now or mattered a lot to me when I was a little kid. I happened to be, you know, like anyone else, I got certain interests, like I happen to be a baseball person and love it and I happen to love animals and I happen to love ships okay and, and when I have even I've, one of my books is about an old ocean liner called the Normandy no kid nowadays even knows what it is they're going to know the Titanic maybe so but when I succeeded it's because I've taken a nugget of something that I care about and made that somehow sing for today's kids okay as opposed to trying to, to like be like, oh, whoa, I got to figure out what the kids are into and then write about, it. okay? So make, pick, make it your topic. Take, take something that you really care about and make that shine. That would be, you know, my strongest advice, okay? Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so what about this? And, and we don't want to spend too much time on this. But, um, I'm sorry, Peter. There, there was a question and I missed okay. it. I'm sorry. No worries. No worries. Um, I'm trying to multitask and do three things at once. Uh, Ellie said, uh, what interest appeal is out there for children's books that are relevant for both parent, uh, parents, adults, and parents or adults and kids? My draft so far are designed subtly for kids and adults. Is there, is there a market for that? So is there a market for a children's book that's relevant for both parents and kids? I certainly think that a good children's book would be in some way relevant to both grown-ups and kids. Um, and it's hard for me to know specifically what she has, you know, in mind there. But, but honestly, I think any good kid's book it has, has an interesting relevance for grown-ups too, in that we respond, we grown-ups respond this in many ways very similarly to kids when we read. And when we're reading to kids, um, you know, I kind of go, I kind of jet back to when I was a kid, when I'm reading a kid's book. So absolutely 100% yes, okay? Um, so, um, what about this business? Of course, the phone keeps ringing uh, while I'm trying to do this, but um, what about this business of number four here? Um, uh, are, uh, yes or no, are you allowed to submit your work to more than one publisher at the same time? Um, what have you, what have folks heard about that? Um, if you read writers' magazines and stuff, um, and we had a, a little panel here of editors and agents. Traditionally, traditionally, publishing is obviously a very old fashioned industry. Traditionally, um, many editors and agents, um, and you'll see this again and again when you look at listings of publishers, that you're only supposed to submit to one editor or one agent at a time and wait to hear back from them, okay? Um, um, and so in other words, you may see this jargon um, that they don't uh, they don't accept simultaneous submissions. OK, that's the jargon. OK, um, I got I got a couple of secrets for you. Number one, <laughs> Robert perked up there. Robert likes secrets. Um, but um, so number one, everybody nowadays in the publishing industry and all established authors everywhere. Don't let them tell you otherwise. Everyone submits simultaneously all over the place, okay? So you can just forget about the idea that there's any prohibition, okay? I always still have, you know, one or two 
folks in seminars who are nervous. Like my wife's from Cincinnati and she's a really nice person. Um, people from the Midwest are, tend to be really nice. I'm from New York, I'm not. But um, so she's always like nervous and afraid about doing things that are wrong or prohibited and stuff. But um, so um, this is a case where she'd probably be nervous about submitting simultaneously. And I'd have to tell her, no, 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 Kathy, no, do it. Um, in fact, I can guarantee you guys of one thing. Um, and that is this, that if you don't submit your, your children's book project to as many different publishers as you have time for, that I can guarantee you that you will die before you get published. Did you hear me? <laughs> um, so uh, the question really is, um, you know, um, what, are, what are people afraid of nowadays? Um, I'm not sure. I think um, the chances of, you know, even if two publishers, I've even had this happen where, where um, I, I, this is a terrible thing to admit, but my agent was submitting one of my books and I meanwhile was thought she was doing it too slowly. So. I, I, I'm sometimes a rogue operator, so I started submitting it on my own, and I ended up we ended up with more than than one offer. So I thought I might get in trouble. Uh, it didn't happen, and the publisher we turned down just said, "Oh, no worries, uh, Peter. Can you show us your uh, first look at your next next manuscript?" Okay, so there really isn't any any downside to that. Any questions? No. Okay. Um, or Robert, did you get any? No. Okay. Um, we're gonna we're gonna keep to the end the um, uh, number five. You'd be better off skipping the submission process, or would you, or would you not? And simply self-publish your work. Let's leave that for our grand finale. Okay. And I'm gonna um, reduce this one. Stop share. And now magically, we're gonna go to number. Somehow we're going to go to number two. Uh, uh, are we seeing number two? Are we seeing this red uh, document here? Are we yes. seeing that? Okay, good. Um, so um, these are some resources uh, I promised you. Um, they're not the only resources you out there, but they're ones that I like. Um, these are, um, you know, reference materials and stuff that you can use with listings of different um, publishers and agents. Um, number one um, is SCBWI, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Um, is anyone uh, a member? Oh, good. Okay. I see somebody raising their hand. Cool. Um, in a normal, when we have more time, I, I'd let you tell us um, what you think of it. Um, but um, it's really the, um, the, the big tuna, the, the law, it's a huge international organization where, um, which includes most of those of us who uh, make our living writing for children and also to their credit also includes many aspiring and new children's book writers plus it also includes many agents and many editors and publishers, okay? So um, at first, you know, I'm not much of a joiner, so I thought, you know, it's about 70, 60, 70 bucks a year to join. Um, I, at first, for years, resisted it. I kept thinking, well, gee, you know, um, selfishly, I was like, well, what am I gonna get out of it, you know? Um, uh, but I realized over the years, I began to realize how many actually really good things I was getting uh, for the membership fee, including um, uh, um, something that, that they publish every August. Okay, this is free for all members. Okay, and this I feel is the best, most up-to-date listing of available uh, of publishers and agents out there, but it's called Publishers of Books for Young People. It's a free listing published by SCBWI for all members, okay? Again, I'm not promoting these guys. I happen to be a member, but, um, but that alone um, is, because it comes out every August, it's a bit more up-to-date than some of the other um, online and published guidebooks. And with that, um, 
along with that listing of publishers, names, addresses, things like that, SCBWI in a nutshell has um, a lot of uh, things you can join if you wish. There are writers um, critique groups in your area. There, there's a Southern New England and a Northern New England subchapter of SCBWI where you can go for meet and greets. Well, right now we're going virtually, <laughs> but um, but um, it, hopefully this, you know, all this will be over. To uh, a really good thing that they offer every February um, is an annual um, conference in New York where publishing exists. Okay. And um, it takes two days, and it's a lot of fun, and it's they're great seminars. You can submit your your draft work to be looked at by editors and agents, and even more than that, um, it's amazing they're, because there are agents and editors who are members and show up at the cocktail hour and stuff. Um, it's it's amazing what connections can happen at something like that. Okay, so. Check it out and see if it's something that, that appeals to you, okay? Peter, uh, Christine noted that she just joined um, SCBWI uh, yep. for $95, and she says that subsequent years will cost less. Okay, cool. Thank you, Christine, whoever you may be. Um, but um, that's a great tip because I forgot the amount and stuff. But, um, okay, so number two, um, another way to get the basic nuts and bolts listings of, you know, publishers and, and agents for your submissions is a little bit of an unusual name for a guidebook, uh, Jeff Herman's Guide to Book uh, Publishers, Editors, and Literary Agents. Uh, like most uh, guidebooks, it's updated every year, okay? And I like this particular book. You're probably going to have to order it on, on Amazon uh, because it's a little less common than the one that comes next. The cool thing about this, Jeff Herman is an agent, okay? So, so um, he, he's got, the way he structured this guidebook is um, he knows the players. So um, every publisher listed, and, and it has most of the major kids' book, uh, uh, not just kids' book, but all publishers, he actually lists different editors on staff, not just the editor in chief. And he actually lists after each person in parentheses, in many cases, he'll list what their interests are. Maybe they like the arts, maybe they like, um, oh, oh, I don't know, ethnic uh, focus books or something, okay? Um, so that's cool. Also in the back of this excellent guide is something that's like a treasure for when the time comes for you, if you, you're looking, somebody had asked about how, how to figure out who might be a, a, a literary agent that would be good for you and that might be open to looking at, at manuscripts. Um, in the back, he has a whole section on literary agents, those who are open to new clients. And it's like a page long on each agent and tells you stuff like, oh gosh, where they went to college, where they grew up, what breakfast cereal they like. <laughs> um, again, I, what I love to do is ask the seminar, why, why would you want to know that? Um, and I think if you're tuned into this process, um, when, you submit, when you submit your work, you sometimes see people out there in listings that you think, hmm, this person sounds kind of like they might be open to, to what I've got, right? So that's not a bad uh, guidebook. This one, this next one, is very common. You'll see it everywhere. Um, Children's Writers and Illustrators Market, published by Writer's Digest uh, magazine. Um, again, it's pretty similar to the Jeff Herman guide, but um, it tends to only have um, the editor-in-chief listed. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? Um, instead of, it doesn't have middle managers uh, listed, We'll talk, we'll talk. Um, plus there's um, another book, I've never used this one, um, Guide to Literary Agents, okay? So that's like sort of the standard boring guide to literary agents. It doesn't have Jeff Herman's like kind of electrifying personality uh, profiles, okay? Finally, um, Horn Book Magazine and Horn Book Guide, it's a very old and prestigious children the magazine it's a review magazine of kids books okay and um 
So it's a good way to see what's out there uh, in the kids' book uh, world, what exists. And finally, the trade magazine for publishing as a whole. It's very expensive to subscribe, which I find irritating uh, and ridiculous. But um, Publishers Weekly um, has two uh, 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 annual editions on children's books, fall, spring children's book edition, and uh, sorry, fall children's book edition and spring. Okay. If you just bought those two issues for like some crazy price of 10 bucks a pop, you, you get a good look at, at the children's book universe. Any questions on this, this slide? Am I bludgeoning you to death? <laughs> uh, Monique asked if they're available at the library and Monique, I, oh, will, yeah. uh, I will look into that. And if libraries are open, that is. <laughs> are yeah, they, we, how, how's we, it going there? Yeah, uh, briefly, uh, we are close to the public still, uh, but we yeah. are doing curbside pickup, so people can still request books. Oh, good, okay. Um, so next one here. Uh, darn, I'm getting good at this. Boy, am I slick. Um, let's see if I can get this one up. Oh, I didn't get rid of it, did I? Let me get rid of that sucker. Um, Are you seeing this? It's this one is sort of blue color, right? Which publishers? Everyone see that? Okay, good. Um, what about okay? We're you know we've we've talked about our resources, um, but um, which you know there are a million different possible publishers to submit your work to. Um, how can we narrow this process down a little bit, okay, and make it a little bit fun? Um, so number one, um, you know, um, I think we all, in, in everything we do, we need to be a little bit bulletproof. Um, are we gonna get some, some rejections when we send our work out? Are we? Yes, we are, okay? And do we, those of us who are, you know, well-published authors, do we get rejected? All the time. Do agents get rejected? Constantly, okay? Uh, anyone know what Dr. Zeus's first book was? People will tell me, oh, Cat in the Hat. No, it was a book called To Think That I Saw It on Mulberry Street, okay? When he first sent that out back in the 40s, I think it was, um, it was rejected by just about every children's publisher of the day before Random House picked it up. Not, that was something like 50 rejections okay uh jk rowling how did things go for her anyone know not well okay every practically every british publisher rejected the first harry potter A everyone lot. rejected it except for scholastic well yep uh, arthur levine in fact uh has an imprint at scholastic and and he's the guy um and now there are a lot of editors kind of kicking themselves aren't there so um, again, I, I have people who come up to me at years after taking my seminar and they'll say, oh, well, I'll say, you still writing and you, are you still submitting? And they'll say, um, no, well, you know, I got, I sent it out and I got five rejections. So I just, I took another course in, um, you know, wood carving and I'm on to that. <laughs> and, and I'm like, okay, after five and, you know, JK Rowling went through like 38. So um, we got to be we got to be bulletproof. We talked about submitting simultaneously, didn't we? Um, so here's how I like to do. Okay, I've got to cut to the chase because I know we're 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 moving <laughs> we're zipping through time here. Um, but what I like to do is sort of um, I, I think it's worth your while to. I know there are many of you probably who have more than one project that you want to submit and that you'd like to get published. That's normal. I got several right now I'd like to get published. Can you show your favorite two or three to a great underutilized resource? I'm not trying to curry favor with librarians, but I think children's librarians know the children's book market way better than we writers do. So instead of, you know, I'm constantly asked and I no longer critique people's manuscripts, OK? 
okay? But don't, rather than asking a writer, go to somebody who really knows the kids' book world, and that's a children's librarian. Take them to lunch, buy them a coffee or something, and ask, you know, um, which do they think of your books is, if your, you know, draft manuscripts is, is the best, or ask your friends, ask your families, or ask yourself, okay? And take that one and, and, and submit the heck out of that, that particular manuscript, okay? So the way I like to do it is take a look at the one, the manuscript I'm going to be working with and send it out. Um, and I kind of um, analyze it a little bit. And I'll say, what, what sort of book is this? Is it a humorous, you know, kind of simple book with a rhythm and rhyme theme? Or is it a, you know, like a maybe a middle kind of reader book with a lot of information. And then I, to try to make it fun, go to libraries and bookstores and, and I try to find books that are sort of, kind of, a bit like the book that I have to send out. And then I take a plain old pencil and a pad and I start jotting down stuff. What am I probably gonna be looking for? in my little research here. What are you going to be looking for? You're looking for books that sort of kind of remind you of what you have to send out. And you're going to be jotting down, it's nice to know who the author is, it's nice to know who the illustrator, but what you really want to know is who's publishing this book, okay? So make yourself a little fun list of publishers of course you have the guidebooks. You can always go online and you can always, you look at publishers' websites, right? You can always look at magazines that list books that are coming out. I just find it's, I'm a tactile kind of person and I kind of like to actually hold and touch books, okay? Arrest me if you must. But, um, so I, <laughs> I like to go to libraries and bookstores and look for books and jot down the publishers and then I've got my list and I go nuts sending out, um, you know, uh, books to the publishers that I think are, are, you know, might or might be likely targets. And I, I'd like to add um, number six here. I'd like to just add a little tip. And that is that, you know, I find that, um, you know, and I'm in the same boat. I find that in the seminars I gave that probably seven out of 10 folks have a book uh, project that's sort of a story book, okay? It's got, this, this is totally normal, a character like Fluffy the Bunny who, you know, Fluffy has um, maybe a little self-esteem issue and, and <laughs> goes off to school one day and um, something happens during the day that challenge, challenges Fluffy, but Fluffy has some special ability or talent that um, allows Fluffy to to um, save the day or, or impress everybody else. And, and you know, so, so there's a little bit of a um, classic storybook, um, you know, progression. Um, something's gained, something's learned. And that's all terrific. There are a million, um, you know, there are going to be millions of storybooks uh, published, you know, in our lifetime, many more. But there is a secret um, uh, way to get, uh, published that people forget about and that is it's pretty simple but um guess what publishers are really looking for they're really really salivating for non-fiction kids books okay and that doesn't mean it has to be about um european history or something and kids uh, publishers are, are really not getting enough submissions of books about stuff about things okay do you have, and I tell you this, do you have a hobby that, you know, instead of, you know, dreaming up a plot, uh, you know, with a bunch of characters, are you a sort of semi, you know, local expert in something like rock collecting or, or you know, carpentry or knitting or um, stargazing or anything? Could your first book be a book about something you know, okay? You've, you've heard before the, the whole concept of writing about what we know, right? Um, and we people forget about it in the kids' book world. Um, could you do the kids' book of knitting? Could you do the kids' book of, um, 
oh, I don't know, um, oh, rock polishing or something, okay? So I, I just throw that out there because I think people, people forget about that. Um, I'm going to put the next slide up, but you can ask me, well, while I'm doing this, um, ask me any questions about that, will you? Or are there any questions on that? <laughs> uh, there are no questions. Um, okay. this, this came in about um, maybe eight minutes ago. So this was on a different point. But Diane wants to know, what are the differences between submitting nonfiction versus fiction books? Okay, so that's interesting because that was kind of like what I was just talking about. What are the differences? Um, she wanted to know the differences between how you submit them. Yes. Okay. Um, there really aren't any differences. By the way, you should be seeing a green handout, are you? Yes. Okay, good. Um, you know, so um, whether your book is nonfiction, maybe it's about, you know, um, healthy vegetables for kids, okay? Or whether it's a, a fictional book about, a you know, uh, a squirrel that eats carrots, okay? Um, there are, the, the only difference really comes in, there are a few publishers out there that, let's say, own, that specialize in certain kinds of nonfiction. And you will see in your guidebook, you know, per using, you will see that the publishers will say, those few publishers out there that say, we only do Spanish-English um, bilingual books, or we only do historical books for kids. There are a few out there. So in those cases, you, you, you obviously don't want to send them a work of, of uh, Fluffy the Bunny fiction, okay? Um, but other than that, um, there's no other, no other difference, okay? Most kids' book publishers are open to both nonfiction and fiction. So here we are. We talked about, talked about you know, publishing companies, but does it matter? Um, couldn't we save time and just um, send our work to scholastic publishing company 800 broadway new york new york 10000 how about that saves time don't have to go fussing around with spelling people's names right right should we do it that way no i don't think so either what will happen we won't be arrested. We won't be vaporized, <laughs> I don't think, I hope. But what will happen to our manuscript um, if we don't send it to a person, probably? Pile? Sorry? Thrown in a pile? <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a very We're good... Just sit in the mail room. Okay, both of those are very possible. My sister, uh, I told you I was from New York. My sister still lives there, works at a publishing company called Workman Publishing. And she sometimes will tell me little stories about life, you know, behind the scenes there. So as you probably have heard, there's something at Workman and every other publisher called the slush pile, the slush pile, right? And that's the pile in at, at some publishers, it's an actual room full of manuscripts that come in without a particular person's name on, okay? So I'm not defending that. I don't think it's good. Any reputable publisher knows that they're eventually supposed to get to replying to all of the stuff that they get, even the stuff in the slush box, okay? But notice at your own work, at your own life, in your own job, when something comes into an office with a person's name on it, certainly when I've had day job, desk jobs, okay, I used to be an assistant and a speechwriter for a college president. When something came in with my name on it, did I make sure that I eventually responded to it? You betcha, okay? And um, if you use a person's name, you will you be able to to follow up with that person if they if you don't hear back right so yes it matters um so um here's a here's an important question what level of editor remember we were talking i mentioned that um that one particular guidebook only gave you the editor-in-chief at a children's publishing company 
okay? That was the children's writers and illustrators market. A lot of people will say, gee, so what's wrong with that? I'm sending my stuff to the top, okay? Uh, terrific. Problem is that, again, it's more fun when I throw this out as a question for the group. Problem is that a lot of top editors at children's book publishing companies are not really looking at manuscripts anymore, okay? They're busy hiring, firing. They're busy with, you know, finance, the budget, all of that stuff. So um, you will see in any listing of editors at children's publishing companies, whether it's the SCBWI listing, whether it's one of those guidebooks I told you about, right? You will see a bunch of names. Are you going to necessarily know these people? Probably not, right? But you're going to see some titles, okay? You're going to see titles like editor-in-chief. You're going to see executive editor. You're going to see editor. You're going to see assistant editors. You're going to see associate editors and editorial associates, okay? So um, to cut to the chase, <laughs> um, it's much more fun to play a guessing game. But um, I, I strongly urge that you um, to make you, this whole process go faster for you and to find your perfect target. Um, I advised lopping off the top people and the bottom people, okay? Forget about the editor-in-chief and forget about anybody with an, uh, a title like editorial assistant or editorial associate, okay? Because they're, they're often the, the, the lowest people in a, in a publishing company um, are editorial assistants or associates, and they're not usually not yet able to take manuscripts that come in and suggest to the full editorial group that these manuscripts look good and need serious consideration, okay? Anyone with the title of assistant editor or associate editor, is a secret guerrilla warfare, Mandel's guerrilla warfare tip that these folks tend to be newer in the industry, okay? But they still, still have the power to go to the editorial board meeting every month with new manuscripts, with your manuscript, okay? And suggest it and recommend it. And they might end up being your editor on the project. And I've, I've even talked to at conferences, some people, especially with the editorial assistant title, they're like, um, I'm actually, they're actually saying that they were somewhat flattered that a, 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 an author, even a new author submitted directly to them and spelled their name right and all of that. Can you believe it? Okay. And here we are, we writers thinking that this is just this castle that we can't, we can't get into the publishing castle, right? In fact, if we're careful and if we're clever and if we go after, um, you know, um, a lower uh, middle managers, I think, um, I think we're, uh, we're better off, okay? Um, I'll ask for questions in just a moment, okay? Um, here's a tip that um, somebody mentioned this. This must have been 10 years ago when I first started doing this seminar. Um, you know, so starting out, none of us, almost none of us are going to have any connections, are we, with, you know, editors or agents. Most of those folks live in New York, you know, we're, we're New Englanders. There are a few, few publishing companies in Boston, okay, but because we don't know anyone, okay, we, we sometimes think, gee, wouldn't it be cool if uh, un my uncle was an editor or an agent or my aunt was a uh, you know publishing exec? Would that be cool? I think it would. Is there a way that we can make create um, try creating a connection when we don't have one? And somebody mentioned this to me. Um, are you a member of an alumni association? Are you an alumnus of a college or a university, or are you a member of some national club? or association or fraternity or sorority that can print you out or email you a listing of fellow alumni, fellow members, and what they do for a living, okay? Can you get um, 
people who went to your college or grew up in your town or are a member of the same club as you, who can you get the names of people who have this association with you and happen to be children's book editors, okay? So um, I tried this actually. Um, here's a tip that a, a student gave me and, I, and I've, I've never, my wife and I went to Middlebury in Vermont for college. So I've, I've you know, got a listing. There are, you know, like 40, 50 Middlebury alums who were in publishing and a, and a few were in kids book publishing. I've never sold a book to a Middlebury fellow alum, but in almost every case where this, this you know, very simple connection was created, it, I developed sort of a relation, a warm relationship with, with this person just because of that, okay? So, so try it if you, if you feel that, that that's something uh, you, you know, that is of interest to you. Um, questions? So Christine wanted to know, uh, and this came in about five minutes ago, are you so, suggesting that it's better to mail a manuscript? Rather uh, than I knew this was coming, yes. You guys are, what a great group. Okay, um, so notice number four here in, in our green handout, okay? I know, you notice that I, I skipped over it. I was expecting this question to come. How to approach editors, an old line industry in an online world, okay? As I think we all know, almost everything now is digital, right? Um, when we correspond, uh, mostly we're doing it digitally by email or by text or by sometimes by phone. Um, so why am I giving you this long lead in? And that's because the book world is, has retained a, a very strange but a very clever sort of hurdle for we writers to, to hop over if we can. When there was a period about 20 years ago when book publishers, children's book publishers, said to writers, if you're going to submit, sure, you can email your manuscript, okay? Anyone want to guess what happened? Email isn't secure. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's one problem. That's a problem, but, you know, so sending stuff by mail, somebody can rip into it and look and all of that. But there was Plus another- it, it would be very, very slow to download, wouldn't it? Yeah, okay. But there was another more pressing problem that happened and it happened immediately. And can't Anyone? mark it up or, or edit it in any way or make comments? Well, that, that, you know, so emailed manuscripts, there are all sorts of, you know, programs now that allow you to mark stuff up and, and, and all of that. I won't bore you with that. But um, so what happened simply was email servers got shut down, okay? Because authors from all over the world immediately started emailing their work to every imaginable editor and publisher they could think of and every agent, okay? So um, what has happened, and, and I keep asking editors about this, is that in the kids book world, there's a little hurdle for us to jump over. And that is most editors, not all, um, those who are, are preferring paper submissions with a manila envelope, plain old paper, stapled, okay? A little cover letter in there. And, um, and you know, um, you're gonna want also to include uh, a self-addressed stamped envelope big enough um, not for the most publishers will will actually send you at their expense the whole manuscript back to you okay but um i always include a, a business sized uh, envelope with my address on it and, a, and enough stamp on it to get a a letter back okay there are some authors believe it or not who in submitting this old-fashioned way um, will enclose, and I'm not kidding, a postcard with a checkbox on it saying, uh, we accept Jackhammer Sam, <laughs> we reject Jackhammer Sam. Um, problem in my book with that is in this often, you know, sometimes difficult, sometimes long process of getting our work to the right people and getting it um, finally accepted 
one of the really good things that happens to we writers along the way is that we build uh, warm and cordial relationships with editors and with agents at some point who want us to succeed. And they want to, sometimes an editor will say to you, you know what, we really like your, your manuscript, Henry the Frog, but you know, we've published too many frog books lately. Can you, is there anything else you can show us? Or sometimes an editor will send you a note back uh, and say, well, we like Henry the Frog a lot, but the ending just doesn't work for us. Can you work some more on that? Okay. Often, by the way, once you've you sent something in with, in, you know, print out on, in, in a manila envelope, then everything moves to email. Are you with me? So it's not an eternal banishment from the, um, from the online world by any means, but it's a hurdle for those of us submitting unsolicited manuscripts. Did that answer your question, I hope? Other questions? Uh, Monique has a specific, well, let's go with Diane's question first. Um, Diane wants to know if it's worth her while to use LinkedIn to connect with editors. Okay, that's a good question. And, um, you know, um, I, I think so. Um, a lot of editors have a huge number of LinkedIn um, followers and contacts. Um, I, I think that that's absolutely fine to do. Can I make a suggestion though? I've had people do this with me because you know they see that I'm a published author. And by the way, you feel free to connect with me. That's cool. And I have a lot of editors just because you know uh, that's the way it goes. I have a lot of editors who are connected with me on LinkedIn. So feel free to look me up through LinkedIn and then you'll, you'll probably automatically get the editors that I'm connected with as suggestions. So go ahead and do that. What I would urge you not to do, because I know people have done this to me and it really bugs me, is um, they, I connect, I'm, I'm generally will connect with people just because I want to be nice about it, right? Then they'll immediately hit me up with trying to sell something, right? Or they'll say, uh, will you, um, you know, look at my manuscript or something like that, okay? So please be polite about linking up with people because um, if you do it with editors of publishing companies and then you ask them after you, right after you've linked to them that, you know, will they look at your manuscript, They're, they may not be um, real happy about that, okay? And uh, Monique has a specific question uh, she says, I have some preschool big books that are meant to be sung to uh, children. Would, okay. you would you submit with recording? If so, what format? Or just submit with written music? Um, that's a good question. So that's, um, so it, the book is intended at, as I'm, I'm trying to understand what she has there. Is it intended to be a CD slash with a book? Monique, why don't you unmute? Um, yeah, 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 I am. Uh, yeah, I, I guess it could be, yes. So um, if that's what you're thinking of, okay, mm -hmm. number one, just to, to make your life easier, you, you might want to try to um, research publishers that do have the capability and the interest in publishing that kind of two-pronged thing, a CD book package, okay? You listed one of your resources that you, you mentioned. It may well be. I mean, it's not something I particularly looked for, but publishers, if you Google that, I think you'll be, uh, get, get the answer much more quickly. Okay. Well, Google you. publishers that do both. And um, so if you're not going that route and if you're just, it, it, I could see a book that was just, uh, had some sheet music, you know, combined with the, the lyrics, right? Mm -hmm. I could imagine that as long as the sheet music, was simple enough for, you know, I'm not a real musical person. I love music, but I can't read. <laughs> I, you know, I can't, I can't look at sheet music, let's say, and, and know what the tune is. Okay. But so if you do it simply and clearly, um, you could, you could submit it to general interest publishers too. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Any others before we go to self-publishing? 
Uh, no other written questions, but um, you uh, just as a warning, Peter, okay. we have about 10 minutes. Okay, good. Okay. Stop share. Now we're going to go start share again. I don't know why there are all these clicks necessary, but I'm probably doing something wrong. Okay, everyone see this ugly orange and brown handout here? Yep. Self-publishing a children's book. Everyone see that? Okay, good. I'll, I'll take silence as a yes. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if that works in court. The witness, do you, <laughs> the witness doesn't have anything to say. All right, you're guilty. Anyway, um, so what about self-publishing? Okay, a lot of what we've been talking about tonight so far has been, you know, traditional publishing. And, you know, it, when you're published traditionally, you know, I think the, the good thing about it is um, you don't have to put any money up front, do you? Okay. You don't have to, who's, who's actually paying for your book to be published? The publishing company. Who's distributing it? The publishing company. Okay. Um, and who's getting it reviewed? That's something publishers really work hard on. Okay. When you self-publish, and, and there, is there anything wrong with self-publishing? Absolutely not, okay? Since the printing press was invented, a lot of the most famous authors in the world have been you know, self-published. Ben Franklin was a printer, okay? Walt Whitman, too. So nothing wrong with it. But you know, when we're, we're in a self-publishing boom right now, and I think that's really democratic and great. But when you're self-publishing, keep in mind that what you're really doing is self-printing, okay? Whether you're doing it digitally or, or, or doing a physical book, you're essentially printing up a bunch of stuff. But then, so you've got to, who's going to go out there and get it distributed and sold and, and displayed in stores and reviewed? Who's going to do that? Who's going to do that? You. Okay. Are you up for that? Um, and, and let me say this. And, um, that we forget, I think, a lot of us, that traditionally published books, books aren't just a thing that gets printed up, okay? Um, books, um, a, a traditionally published book actually steps up on stage in the book universe, um, and it gets noticed because that it's, it's, it, this is the way the industry works. I'm not defending it, but the industry is such that that new books that are traditionally published tend to step up on stage and get reviewed and get noticed and get written about, okay? And get stocked by, by Barnes and Noble. And, and anyone can get their book on Amazon. So no worries there. But, but when you self-publish, your book isn't going to have that moment in the, in the spotlight unless you really go to town and, and you know, really get it out there. Okay, so I will warn you about this, that books do better, self-published books do better when um, authors have a way to sell it, okay? Like I do a lot of speaking. I can take my books with me and audiences sometimes will buy one. Do you have something? Are you <laughs> somebody who, I don't know, um, referees basketball games, okay? Can you take your basketball book to the game? Okay. Are you somebody who, um, I don't know, does um, craft shows? Can you take your book with you? Okay. If you don't have a platform, you know, you may end up, a lot of people who self publish end up hitting up um, cousins, <laughs> you know, uh, uncles, aunts, friends with, you know, trying to get them to buy it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm throwing that out there just so we all understand. Um, that it sometimes takes a lot of work and it sometimes um, um, works best if we have a way of, of meeting people and, and also taking our book with us while we meet, okay? So um, with children's books, I also find that most authors really kind of want a physical children's book to share. You can do it easily and you can do it cheaply if you do your book on your website or if you do a Kindle book, or digital only. 
that costs almost nothing, okay? And it'll be there. But um, for most of us, and it's certainly I'm there, I'm old fashioned enough to want a physical book. And if you're going to do it that way, I would highly recommend print on demand. That's the newest technology in publishing. And that way you don't have a hundred thousand copies printed up in boxes in your basement. Uh, any questions on that stuff? I'm sure we're, we're t the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking and the, and the space shuttle is about to launch. But any, any questions on self-publishing? I don't see any written questions in the chat. Nope. Okay, how about, uh, we probably oh, have- I, I'm sorry. Um, well, I guess you kind of already addressed Anne's question, so never mind. Um, do people have questions or comments in general they want to throw out? I think we have like three minutes. Um, ask me anything. <laughs> As long as it's clean, doesn't even have to be clean. Ask me anything. Except my social security number. So does anyone have any comments or questions for Peter? You can unmute yourself and, and how, ask them. How long from the time you submit to the time, uh, the time you're accepted to be published and the book comes out? What's the time? Another very good question. Um, I found it to be all over the place, okay? I've had, uh, after acceptance, um, um, you know, a month or two later, discussion about did I like this or that illustrator, um, then another two months, never even got to work with said illustrator, uh, finished books in mail, showed up. Uh, I was quite angry about that after about, you know, six months. More likely, it's a process of a year and a few months at least. And sometimes I've had one or two cases where books accepted, it gets pushed to the bottom of the pile. Um, two years go by uh, or two and a half. So there's a range. And sometimes in the worst case scenario, I've had a book where I got an advance. It was illustrated. This is a British publisher. Uh, sadly, it never was published. And, um, you know, I had to get the rights back and everything, but it just was a sad thing. But, but all of that stuff can happen when, you, you know, we're out there in the big, bad uh, world of, of business, okay? I have a question. Have sure. you ever um, rejected illustrations? If Sorry, say it again? Have you ever rejected an illustrator? Another excellent question. Um, um, I would say I have strongly said to publishers, you know, I really don't think this person's the right fit for this, this manuscript. I have. I'd say early on in your career, and I felt this strongly in my first couple of books, that I tended to be a lot, um, you know, more amenable to illustrators that the publisher thought were right, and but I thought maybe weren't the best, okay? Generally speaking, I found publishers suggested illustrators to be way better than I ever imagined, dreamt of, and their sample illustrations to be remarkably creative and terrific. So rather than it being a moment of horror, okay, just so you know, it's been a moment of pure joy to see the, you know, stunning and hilarious and wonderful, um, you know, illustration uh, and illustrators that, that have been proposed. Okay. And are you um, able, a bit more early on? I do have another question with that. Sure. I'm sure, like myself, I'm writing something and I have in mind what I want. Can yep. you express that to an illustrator? Um, oh, sure. Write that sure. in your manuscript. Oh, sure, you can. Um, don't you don't have to. Please don't do that. Um, in your submission. Okay. Wait until. Um, everybody, by the way, um, has a clear, you know, I've brought this up in, in class in different seminars, almost everybody has a clear and vivid idea of how, you know, they see their book being illustrated. And, and so don't, don't feel embarrassed about that or shy. That will be part of your, you know, collaborative work with the illustrator. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks. So, Peter, do you have any last, um, I, so unfortunately, we'll have to stop it here at seven because I have a coworker who needs to 
run our program using the Zoom account. But Peter, do you, do you have any, um, take 30, 60 seconds, and do you have any last minute pieces of advice for the group? Um, no pieces of advice. Well, I, I would say this, that um, I think if you're persistent, um, you know, uh, it's, it's like, um, one, it's like anything in life. There will be some, some rejections. There will be some moments when you're thinking, well, gee, maybe um, I'd move on to another hobby or, or, you know, something like that, or take up photography. But, but the one or two people in this group tonight who do get um, published within, you know, the next couple of years will be the two people who are really almost nutty almost kooky about getting back on that course, okay? And being persistent. Um, I know it sounds boring and I know it sounds, you know, tough, but, but it can be done. And, and I hope you will tell me when, when you've gotten a nibble or a bite from a publisher, because I look forward to, to uh, hearing from you and having you compete with, with me in the marketplace. <laughs> Okay. Right. <laughs> well, Peter, thank you so much for, for uh, take, taking the time out of your busy thank schedule you. to be with us oh. for 90 minutes. And uh, you packed a lot of information in there, uh, answered lots of questions. I appreciate your flexibility. My pleasure. And I, I, I really mean it when I say those are good questions. Yeah. So everyone, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Peter. Uh, Peter, I don't know if you can see the chat, but everyone is saying thank you. So we oh, appreciate thank you. it. Thank you, guys. Have All right. Night. Until we meet again, I hope to see everyone on Tuesday and Thursday night uh, for the other writing talks, if you're so inclined. And uh, Peter, I'm sure we'll see you down the road again. So Sounds thank good. you Sorry all so you much. to meet the cats, though. So. Yep. Thank you all so much, everyone. Have a great yeah. night. Cheers. Bye-bye.